Hi everybody, welcome to Adobe Live on Behance.net. My name is Michael Jarrett, I'm hosting. We're here today with Lucas Albrecht, welcome. So uh, we've had a really busy, awesome day so far. This is the last stream of the day. We're gonna be live for the next two hours um, and we'll be live at this same time tomorrow and the following day. So please come back. We're gonna see a really awesome project as it gets developed. We'll take a look at the schedule of the day that we've already had. So 9 a.m. we had Rachel Roth, 11 a.m. we had Stephanie. Uh, they're gonna be live at the same time tomorrow and the following day. So come back, there's a full day of content tomorrow and the following. Um, we're gonna spend the next two hours doing some cool stuff. Uh, and just so you know, there's always a challenge going on. Uh, so in the next hour and a half, uh, our challenge, your challenge, is to create a recipe card uh, using InDesign. The theme is summer, so please find your favorite dish, summer themed, create a recipe card and share it with the URL. And we're gonna be taking a look at that in about an hour and a half. We're gonna be taking a look at all of them. We'll pick um, our favorites. We'll do a little bit of talking and some critique on, on all of them. Uh, so we'd love to see what you create. And if you're joining us, let us know where you're coming from right now, where you're watching from. Um, we want to find out how many people are up at 4 a.m., how many people are at work right now. We won't tell your employer. Um, but please let us know in the chat pod where you're coming from, um, and we'll give you some shouts out. Uh, one more thing, chat and win in about 25, 30 minutes. Um, if you've participated in the chat and said hello or asked us a question, told us where you're from, we're gonna be giving away something really cool. It's this O-Crop InDesign pin. Uh, so that pin could be yours. Uh, all you have to do is sign in to behance.net slash live and participate in the chat, say hello, say something, and this pin could be yours. So that's it for housekeeping. Um, Let's let's talk about you, Lucas. Let's, do let's it. talk about who you are, where you're from. I've got your portfolio, your Behance portfolio, pulled up here. Cool. Um, so I just want to hear a little bit about your bio, and we can take a look at some interesting projects here before we get started today. Sounds great. Oh, right there. All right, yeah. cool. <laughs> hey, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm Lucas Albrecht. Um, I'm a designer and art director. Uh, I just wrapped up a uh, MFA program at Cranbrook Academy of Art. Uh, in the past month i've moved out of there into chicago and then now to brooklyn and then today i'm here in san francisco super excited to do this <laughs> moving a lot uh yeah hopping up all over the place um yeah uh more bio stuff more yeah no that stuff. sounds great i mean how are you liking new york it's you know it's been short so far but it's been great yeah. uh, it's super exciting mostly in brooklyn but yeah super fun a lot going on and that's been within the past month that you moved there yeah, I, I finished up uh, grad school, went back to the Midwest, see some family, and then bought a one-way ticket to Brooklyn. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so we have your Behance portfolio pulled up, and I'm kind of cool. curious uh, if you want to mention a few uh, projects sure. that are either really interesting or recent, and, and we can kind of go through them, and you can explain what they're all about. Yeah, sure. Um, so the bulk uh, of the stuff that we're looking at right here uh, was done while at Cranbrook. Um, so, I mean, I think from an editorial design standpoint, and, I mean, we can hop around for this portion, but uh, the most exciting stuff to do was both the reviews, which we did. Uh, we have like a crit. The crits are kind of at the core of what we do there. And then we have sort of the thesis books, uh, what we're looking at here. Nope, wrong way, that way. Uh, <laughs> it's a thesis <laughs> book for um, Alberta Tramberg. She's an amazing artist uh, working in metal uh, from the metalsmithing department. Um, and we collaborated on this uh, for some time. It was a mix of, you know, a few different people took photos. Uh, so curating those photos, working through, you know, pagination flow, all of that, and trying to understand sort of how that materiality could translate to a book. But also think about like, you know, her, her work was so much about having it in your presence and sort of like, um, you know, uh, feeling through the work. Uh, so some of those things just aren't, you can't necessarily, you know, translate them directly to the book format, but you can sort of explore them in a different way uh, when it flattens. So looking at, you know, graphic form from 3D objects, but also, um, you know, respecting the work and catering to it through the materiality of a book. Um, so yeah, it's super fun to do those kinds of things. Uh, I've done quite a few while there, and artists tend to be really incredible clients in the sense that, you know, this is their body of work and they're really connected to it, uh, as opposed to someone kind of mediating for uh, someone else's work. Right. Does that make yeah. any sense? 
Um, they're also, you know, very particular uh, and invested clients. So I'm sure that brings a whole other set of expectations and pressures. But for the most part, it's been super fun to do those kinds of things. All right. And so that was your thesis work. You that said. was uh, Alberta's thesis book. Yeah. Um, and then I did quite a few of those. Uh, Emily's thesis book uh, is the one that you're looking at right there that you're going to click on. Uh, and she was also in the metals department, but didn't quite work with metals so much. Uh, she wrote a really sort of long and thorough essay. Uh, and her book was more about kind of catering to the like sort of uh, aesthetic language of her inspirations and keeping a certain level of respect to her writing, um, but also showcasing like just beautifully art directed photos that, um, you know, she really had a vision for how she wanted her things to be showcased in book form. Uh, and just the level of craft of her work is really, you know, intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> intimidating. Yeah, yeah, for great, sure. It's great word. Really beautiful. Yeah. Um, well, it sounds like, yeah, the collaborative nature of these two projects in particular is, mm -hmm. is highly important both to respect their vision um, and, and also to sort of reveal or highlight, mm -hmm. you know, maybe things that you brought from your own perspective or from the form itself, the, the book itself. Totally. Yeah, I think to me, especially with these kinds of projects, the best way to think of it is like, you know, it's, it's a brand new piece of work that I get to collaborate um, on them with and sort of their work is source material for this new work, you know, so it's not so much like, you know, the book is a vessel for what they've done previously, but sort of a brand new piece that gets to use uh, the photography of their work as uh, material. Great. Arturo Gomez, thank you for asking. We got a question from him. Uh, what project has been the most challenging for you and why? <laughs> right now, the most immediate answer is being live. <laughs> but I'll get over that. Um, project has been, been most challenging for me. Um, I think just the way in which I've been approaching uh, editorial work and kind of the way in which I've been facing my early design education and sort of how loaded some of these principles are, you know, like I come from kind of like a more, uh, I want to say strict modernist grid based structural like way of thinking. And a lot of that still lives in my work. And I love a lot of that. And a lot of that is why I fell in love with design in the first place. But starting to question um, what that kind of structure means, you know, like there's ideology behind form and sort of, you know, when we do make these decisions, when we keep things clean or we keep things organized, when we impose ourselves uh, in a very structural way onto these design objects, uh, what does that mean? So I think that was not a good answer to your question. <laughs> uh, but kind of keeping myself in check while designing and, and sort of when do I cater uh, to what I want to see. You know, I think that within any project there's sort of, you know, and this is an overgeneralization, so of course it's false, but I think there's like three sets of expectations we kind of got to keep in mind. One is a commitment to the brief that's given to us. So whatever that it is that's coming from the outside, whatever that's sort of, you know, catering to a viewer, catering to an audience, catering to a client. The second one is what do we want? So the sets of expectations that come from ourselves, sort of the redrafting of that brief to match what we really want. And then third, uh, it's the, what the object wants. So that's like a more abstract, weird way to think about it. But I think that that's, that's different from what the audience wants and it's different from what I want. Uh, sometimes the object has their own, you know, set of expectations uh, that we have to listen to and, and challenge or, or lean into. That's interesting. Yeah, well, in developing that sensitivity to the object itself, I mean, that sort of transcends. Um, I, it's, it's easier to sort of put to words yeah. what a client wants in terms of sure. a brief and what you want in terms of your experience, expectations, your willingness mm -hmm. to take on certain projects. Uh, but listening to, for lack of a better word, totally. an object or the form itself. Um, listening is definitely, you know, at its core. I think it's like, it's playfulness too. It's the willingness to play with the thing as you're working on it and to listen to it and be able to throw something and then, you know, try to figure out what it means later or, yeah. Awesome. Well, I also came <laughs> from a very strict modernist grid-based undergraduate yeah. program. Um, it was always interesting and even sh stressful in, in trying to break free from that. Um, and But playfulness, I think, is the word that best describes how to kind yeah. of get there, or at least start mm -hmm. um, break, breaking free from that. So, And I, I mean, I, I haven't experienced a client that hasn't been excited by something that you've come up with out of investment, right? So even if it is a strict sort of client project, from my experience, if you jump in and you go through sort of the crazy, weird ideas mm -hmm. and, and, you know, 
uh, you see what happens. I think that ultimately you end up at a better, more thorough understanding of the project than if you just sort of go to what you think will work best. Right. Well, I can see that that um, type of thinking has led to some really interesting projects just based on your portfolio. <laughs> I know that today we're going to be exploring um, something, as you were kind of telling me a little bit about mm -hmm. it earlier, was it kind of blew my mind in terms of conceptually <laughs> what, what we're going to try and accomplish today, what you're going to try and accomplish today. Um, and so maybe we can get into that and, and you can start to describe what it sure. is that you hope um, we'll be exploring in InDesign and what you hope to get out of it. Yeah, totally. Um, and anyone and everyone, please stop me whenever. <laughs> yes, we love questions. Um, they can be high or low. It can be left or right. Um, this is a really great chance for everybody to kind of like learn, for us to learn and see what people are interested in, what, you know, if it has to do with this project as you see it develop, that's great. Um, if you have questions about InDesign or anything you see, put them in the chat pod and we'll make some time um, uh, to, to answer them. Lucas can answer them, I can answer them, maybe the rest of the community can. And of course, you have a really great chance to win that cool pin that we saw earlier, if nothing else. So the three things. Cool, so I'm gonna keep going back and forth between a couple of things, keeping it super transparent. I have a little bit of an outline. You know, don't, don't pretend that it's not up when it's up. It's mm -hmm. all good, mm -hmm. I'm just checking in a little bit. Um, so I think that this project for me, for the most part, it's, um, it's three things. And this project, meaning um, this piece of editorial design that we're working on together. Uh, one, it's uh, about, about design. as a generative practice. Much as we're generating the first thing on air, live in front of you. Do you want to explain Two. a little bit? Sure. Or maybe we're going to go into this yeah, after. Yeah. Um, what, you, what you mean by design as a generative process? Yeah, so I think that um, before going to grad school, there was an essay that made a really big impression on me, and I won't belabor it too much, but it called out for this sort of like next um, chapter in the history of design discourse, where there'd be a maturation and design would evolve into maybe uh, the kind of discourse that makes the tools for more design. Um, so instead of focusing on designing the thing, uh, we're more so designing the thing that makes the thing. Um, I see a question about the pen tool in InDesign. <laughs> uh, so design is generative. I think I like the idea of uh, things that open things up. Uh, I don't necessarily get as excited about answers as I do about questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so design is a generative process, I think, you know, in, in a really sort of like um, simple way. And, and, and I, I do think of it in a simple way, but it's, it's, it's opening things up and, and seeing how tools can make more tools or how uh, we can sort of differentiate between being users of tools and being sort of makers that leverage tools uh, into unique forms of, of, of making. I think, you know, for example, InDesign is a super powerful tool. It lets us do so much. But if you sort of play by the rules as you uh, perceive them, um, you make work that looks like InDesign. I think like the entire Adobe suite, it's just, it's so powerful and it has so many different, you know, like ways to sort of enter um, that if you then start looking at it and start bending it uh, to kind of try to open things up and, and, and use InDesign to make instead of making through InDesign uh, and hopefully we'll get a better sense of that once we <laughs> get right, going. Right. Um, but I think that that's kind of what I mean, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, and I think I think that just from what I know, uh, anticipating what we're going to be, what you're going to mm -hmm. be working on today, what we're going to see is um, InDesign being used in a way that is, uh, at least for me, kind of non-traditional. In, in the end, we're still working with um, type and image and layout and um, and structure. Um, but I'm really excited, and I think everybody will be really excited to see mm -hmm. how you're going to use scripts to actually automate some things um, and, and create content in a way that sort of furthers your own capacity. The tool itself has, its, has this capacity to create content and put it on a page in a simple sense. And again, I think that we'll probably see what that 
actually looks like when we get down to creating some things. Yeah, totally. And so we're listing out the other two tenets of the things that we're gonna explore today. We do have some other questions too, but I will save them. Yeah, like you were saying, scripting, um, you know, it's not just, it's looking at what InDesign already offers and seeing other ways that we can use it, you know. Uh, like right now, we're not using the pen tool the right way. <laughs> and I think it's funny. But also, um, it, it leads to form that's just a little different than what you would get otherwise. You know, if I wrote it on a piece of paper or if I used the brush tool uh, and then import it or whatever, we wouldn't get something as like quirky as we're getting here in the same way that, uh, you know, scripting, generally speaking, points at productivity and efficiency. Uh, and, you know, I've, in the professional, uh, as a professional, I've experienced scripting and design mostly as a tool for uh, productivity and efficiency. Um, that's great, and it works great, and we should keep doing that whenever needed, but also it, it, there's opportunities um, for using it differently. Um, yeah. Cool, well, we're excited to see it. So do you want to Sweet. describe the archive? So archive, uh, we'll have a little section. Uh, so first little section, kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's a little, some piece of writing that I wrote that we'll like work through um, in the layout. The second section is a little archive of projects that in my mind are both um, foundational to how we can look at design as generative, uh, and how we can look at tools that make tools that make tools, um, but also that are inspirational and I think are doing these kinds of things or uh, approaching design in sort of an open way and, and ending up with exciting form uh, with, with, you know, projects that are exciting, which you know, right. they have to be. <laughs> and uh, are these uh, any of your own projects or are these other artists and designers work that, um, again, are foundational yeah. or inspirational or both? Other designers, yeah, for sure. Um, we, could, we, we, we looked at my work already. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so yeah, just a little list that I compiled that I think serves as a good sort of like entry way. It's not, all-encompassing, um, but it, it, I think it's just like a good way to sort of frame this whole thing based on what has already happened. Great, oh. cool. And um, we spoke about this earlier, this, uh, whether you call it a book or a publication, sure. um, we're, we're almost sort of removing those constraints in a traditional sense. Mm -hmm. We're working in InDesign using type, image, and layout, working with spread and a grid as a structure mm -hmm. as you would work on a book. Um, but knowing that this is kind of uh, an exercise mm -hmm. in um, speaking about these things that are interesting to you, um, but you know, maybe it is printed or maybe it takes yeah. on a digital format and there's kind of some interesting ambiguity there right. uh, in what it is, right? I think in some ways the format of an you know, a piece of editorial design within InDesign is sort of the vehicle for us to have these conversations. And the video itself maybe is the piece that we're making. Um, but you know, I, I think, I don't know, there's like a, especially at Behance, and I'm sure you guys have seen this, uh, there's a ton of, you know, poster design that exists entirely digitally. And more than anything, it's like an opportunity to like showcase what you're into, what you can do. Uh, so it's both like young designers, uh, trying to figure out, you know, like what their sort of voice is, um, but also trying to sort of like, you know, wave a flag and showcase what they're into both to get work, but also just to be part of the community. So in the same way where, you know, the poster can serve sort of as a, a vehicle for that kind of expression, uh, and that transcends maybe what a poster has been or should be, or, you know, being that right. it's entirely speculative or digital, uh, we can play with the idea of a piece of editorial design in this context uh, being sort of that, you know, uh, proverbial quadrangle through which we experience <laughs> this stuff. Right. But it's a frame. Uh, it's a frame. In, in, in a frame. In its most, yeah, in, in a its frame. most yeah. abstract sense. Yeah. So, great. Well, I think we should dive in and, t and uh, I'm going to let you lead sort of this process. Uh, I know you have an outline. I know cool. we're going to be doing some playing and experimenting as well. Sure, and again, sure. if anybody has questions, be sure to ask us uh, along the way and we'll, we'll try and answer them. Cool. So, let's get my spread here going. Go back to my outline real quick. Um, so, in order to make this possible, 
so I'm going to start talking about this sort of like, you know, play on these ideas. So how did we set this up? There's a component to this project um, that's scripted, um, as Michael mentioned a little bit, uh, and that relies on this sort of uh, network or community of computers. Um, So these right here, these friends, are in New York, and these are in Detroit. So right here on your left, those computers, um, they're, so we set up a temporary network slash community of computers. It is kind of what gives the, a voice to this experience. Um, these first uh, three computers are uh, watching and taking screenshots, storing and making screenshots accessible, and uh, they're grouping publicly accessible computers that provide data, while this third one uh, is collect collecting data and making it available for InDesign. And so when you say watching and taking screenshots, you mean that there are three computers set up in New York right now that are tuned into this yeah. Behance stream, and at regular intervals, they are t taking screenshots and making those available to you via a network. Yes, and I, I hope <laughs> we get some questions on that, and I really, really hope they're within uh, my scope of understanding. I collaborated with someone, Sam Panter, uh, who I've worked with on a few different projects, and I sort of came to him with this idea of uh, can we sort of open up InDesign as a tool and kind of bring the streaming component of this experience into the process of making the book? So he set up the system. Uh, he, 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 you know, scripted, he coded it. Um, while I more so, you know, art directed sort of what I wanted from uh, the program. Just so you guys know, if you if you have questions, technical questions, uh, we will eventually once this the this three-day project is going, post everything on GitHub so you guys will have access to all the scripts that we that I use throughout and my files and you can kind of dive in um, and understand those a little bit better. Uh, as I bring that up though, I did want to say, and I'll, I'll post this along with the project and once it goes up to Behance or, um, you know, to GitHub, that was one of the best uh, references uh, that kind of Sam looked at while putting this together. Um, so it's not all encompassing and a lot of this stuff really you have to turn to the community to try to make it make sense out of it and, and, and figure out how it happens but since we're here let me go ahead and run this script so you guys can see the script that I just ran excuse me um, generated a new spread so in this spread we have date and time um, back here, not line. Date. We have news. We're also learning a new way of writing where the lines cannot be connected. <laughs> In in sequence, you know, I am a hundred percent sure that there is a very simple tweak. All right, uh, to the pen tool, and if anyone out there uh, on Behance Chat Land wants to point this in the right direction, I will appreciate that. But I almost kind of like how it fails every letter that I write. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, like every other designer, I am a hack, and I hack my way through. So this right here is a screenshot. Um, so some of you, depending how things are going, are going to get, you know. Uh, into the publication through that. Um, so yeah, so this is just kind of uh, the result of that network of computers in mm -hmm. New York. It, it's kind of interesting. We were talking about frame within a frame within a frame, kind of like going mm -hmm. in that, you know, on this live stream, we've already generated a screenshot of the live stream, um, and that will happen at what interval? Well, it, it, so or is it always? There's, there's uh, a screenshot being taken every 30 seconds. Uh, 
So if I generated a new spread right now, it would probably have the same one. I lost sense of time. But uh, so there's a screenshot generated every 30 seconds, and it kind of has it ready to go whenever I run the script. So uh, I open up the script panel right here, auto environ. So we're calling this environmental data. Um, so yeah, and then uh, right here, we have a little update on how Ethereum is doing. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention uh, this setup right here is usually uh, mino crypto mining cryptocurrency, so it's taking a little break from that to help us out with the project. All right. <laughs> uh, thanks, Sam. Uh, and you know we have a little bit of a weather update here. <laughs> it's a nice hard shadow A. We'll just see it from one side. It's that A can be whatever that A wants to be. Right, you know? exactly. I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to force it to be anything else. Alexander is asking um, the screenshots are stored somewhere, mm -hmm. correct? And then this script is retrieving them from. Right. Uh, yeah, one of the computers is taking the screenshots and storing them. Um, and then they're being made available on the cloud mm. for me. And then there's another computer that's getting it ready so that it can be brought into my publication. Amazing. <laughs> it's is uh, three amazing the minimum to me too. necessary to to make this happen? I think there's four set up right now, but then if you think about it, uh, because you know everybody's being made present here, there's an almost you know infinite sort oh, of like see, right. community of computers that makes this possible. You know, like everyone that's watching us right here, um, it kind of builds forever. But the way that he set it up, I think he needed he needed four computers. Um, there's always other ways to do things. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, there is. Uh, and you know, of course, like I would have, I would have never come to this specific um, setup by myself. Uh, so yeah, it really depended on how Sam thought it, it would be possible. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and this is all what's conceptually interesting about this for mm -hmm. you. It's it's the process itself is. Totally. Um, only able to be done in this time, in this place, because these specific people have a certain amount of knowledge they acquired and you group mm -hmm. together. It's, I mean, it's just, it's fascinating, and, and I imagine that is what is the most interesting. Part yeah, of I this. think you know, like every time I generate a spread, that spread could have only have been generated at a specific time, right? Because that, the chat will never look like that again. It's never going to be the same time, same day. Um, the the top news hit isn't going to be the same. Uh, the weather could change, though it doesn't change too much. Is that a San Francisco weather? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, my current location. Great. Um, and then this last one is, uh, and if you want to hop back on my Behance real quick, I can kind of show you guys, mm -hmm. not to make you jump around, but if you click on that, it's, so we, I, I've exported this little animation um, into frames, and then it's going to frame by frame, not every frame, because that animation has like kind of a, I am very much new to animating. Uh, it has more frames than it needs to, but so I, I've broken it down into like a simplified sort of like uh, keyframe set, and it will sort of make uh, the animation through the publication as we go through it. Yeah, incredible. Oh. So we just need to be able to flip through it at light speed. <laughs> yeah, basically, <laughs> or, or 24 you know, frames just per second. click yeah. really fast when we get to that uh, Shift W situation, you know. Nice. But we have only one, so yeah. Great. Cool. So what we see here, I just. Uh, mm -hmm. to explain it for myself even is like yeah. we have a frame of content and all of this content has been procedurally generated or, or generated yeah. um, you know it's it's sourced from multiple locations brought in in this moment mm -hmm. and that frames uh, a center area which is yet to be filled with content um, and and we're going to be doing that um, spread after spread after mm -hmm. spread until we build up a larger, yeah. a larger piece. So one way to think about it almost is like this is the goofiest version of a page number possible. You okay. know? <laughs> like, right. Because then every every page, every spread has like you know some sort of demarcation of, that's unique to that spread. So instead of having one, two, three, we're having all of this nonsense uh, on every spread as reference points for where you are. In, totally. Somewhere in time and space. Yeah, and then you know. Um, all of this stuff is sort of built out of um, tools that can be used in different ways, like scripting with efficiency. So I worked in-house uh, at an auction house, 
and our entire sort of like, you know, catalog uh, caption system. So every piece that was in a catalog had a caption. We had a script that would bring out of the, the CMS, uh, the content management system, uh, that information that was tagged to the image. So we would click on the image, generate a caption, and through scripting, not that different from this, you know, get, um, get that information on the spread. Right, so you, using a tool typically associated with productivity, bringing mm -hmm. it in and kind of uh, playing with it, tweaking it to create something um, of your own, really. And yeah. as a way of talking about that system. <laughs> <laughs> totally, yeah. Cool. Well, I've seen a, a few people are loving this idea and think it's really interesting <laughs> um, <laughs> now that they're here with us. We're going to do chat and win hype. I just saw that. So the countdown is over. In one minute, we're just going to... We're going to call a name. It's going to magically appear on our screen. You're going to read it. No, I mean, we don't know what it's going to be. I hope you can pronounce it. Um, so just say hey, say hype, say spell it any way you want. And one random winner is going to one random winner is going to um, get the name. Are we going to queue up a video? Okay, we triggered a video. Look at this. We're going crazy. Okay, so we should have a winner. Any moment, it's resolving on our screen. There's millions of tiny pieces that need to be put back together. That's from Willy Wonka, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like my head explodes every once in a while. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah that one's good. Go. Ah! Winner is rendering. Transferring, downloading, parsing, resolving. It still hasn't arrived. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Arturo Gomez. Oh, right. Congratulations, Arturo. I know he's been in here. Parse, download, load. He's, he's been asking us some really great questions all along. Take hold. It's on screen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, congratulations. You're going to get that pin. Um, it says O-Crop. It's really funny. <laughs> I don't know who designed these. We don't actually. The InDesign team, perhaps. Um, hopefully, we'll see a whole set of InDesign tool puns, because what's better? Nothing. Free cake. I don't know. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get back into this process. Um, and curious cool. where we're going to go next, now that we've sort of described how this, how some of this is built, mm -hmm. um, what's next? So I think the first thing is I'm going to kind of show you guys a little bit uh, of how I set up um, a gr my grid. Um, so because of this, because of the way this project is structured, because of the way in which the scripts are directly relating to how I've set up my master. Um, Everything on the master is uh, like named so that the script knows where to uh, feed information. Uh, I can't, you know, I, I had to kind of come with a pre-made uh, document, so I'm just gonna make a new document um, just to kind of walk through that process for a little bit. Um, I'm just making those pages eight and a half by eleven because why not? Uh, <laughs> Standard. Cool. Um, so, whenever making decisions about the grid that you expect to, you know, apply to the entire document uh, or a section, because you can make several masters, you know, we go to the master. Uh, one thing that I do all the time that is very annoying is I select only one page from the master, and then I make all these decisions about margins, and then it only applies to that one page. So, selecting both pages in the master. <laughs> all right. Um, Productivity hack. <laughs> yeah, or intended functionality. Yeah. Um, probably just like oversight I personally make too often, but <laughs> you guys probably don't. Um, so where do we start as far uh, as a uh, grid goes? I think for me there is um, two sort of different paths that I can take. One is I sort of start from a place of structure, so I kind of come up with like a larger sort of system, and then I uh, 
I work inside of that system and I let that system sort of yield something. The other one is I'm playing, I'm drawing, I'm drafting, I just have a, a random idea and then I sort of engineer out of that sort of whatever that is a, some larger system. Uh, for this project in specific, I started from a pretty simple place where I kind of had a general sense in my mind of what I wanted uh, those captions to look like, being that it was something that would happen on every single page. Um, so this is the type. Um, so I, I could, you know, 14 by 16 uh, of, uh, I don't actually know if it's, if you say SCTO, SECTO, mm. SCTO. SCTO. Did you say SCTO? I've never said it before. Okay, I've never said it before either. This happens all the time with design stuff where like it's just in my head and then if I ever have to say it out loud, I'm like, oh, I've never said those words right. out loud. But, um, and th that's the typeface that that's you're a typeface. just pronouncing. Yeah, it's a, I think it's relatively new. It's a Shiktoika uh, face. Um, so cool. So yeah, from this place, I think that um, one thing that I always do, go to baseline options, figure out if you're working on a baseline grid or depending on what you're doing, set it to wherever you need to. But uh, from this place of having 14 by 16, um, that, may, that sort of informed uh, a lot of the decisions that I made. So I actually went ahead and made my uh, margins uh, uh, nine points, not inches. Uh, all the way around, except uh, the inside. And this is like, you know, a gutter issue. I always try to overcompensate in my gutter uh, to get type or whatever out of there. Um, if this thing is never getting printed, it doesn't ultimately make uh, too much of a difference. Um, but we're going to do that anyway. Um, Command R to show the ruler. Um, if you don't want to have to keep writing points when you're working points. If you make your ruler points, um, then that's how it shows up for you uh, inside of any pop-up window when you're working through. Um, so then I create guides. Uh, some people make columns inside of that window. Um, I never do. I usually make my columns out of guides. Um, so for this in particular, I just wanted to come up um, with something that would uh, yield the sort of like margin size that I needed. Um, so I think I ended up being, you know, like, and then, and then I deleted uh, the lines that I didn't need. So just kind of working through this stuff to give it to you guys as an example, I kind of did something like this and then kind of got rid of everything I didn't want to end up with something like this. Um, and then, but then, cause I, that's in that sort of like that border uh, where all the activity is going on in here. Uh, and then from this kind of place, I knew that I wanted sort of like uh, a line that divided this space. Uh, and then I kind of added some, uh, some guides that split um, the page in ways that I thought would be useful. Um, we're making a grid you know, you can base it on, if you're making a baseline grid, you can make it on, base it on the baseline, so you just divide that sort of active space uh, by whatever uh, your letting is, and that, you know, work out that way. If you're not respecting a baseline, it makes things a little bit easier, but I always am dubious of grids that are sort of, um, have too many lines in them. Mm -hmm. uh, just because at some point, it, if you have too many options, then you might as well not have a grid. Right. Um, and that's another question, like, you know, why have a grid? Um, what is it about the grid and design history that we feel like we have to start from that place? You know, grids are systems and systems are rigid. Uh, that's not always the answer, right? Um, and it sort of, at that point, already blocks off a certain amount of, I don't know, intuition or some other source of balance mm -hmm. and composition that might come from somewhere else other than math or uh, geometry, for example. Yeah, um, and, but in the same way, the grid is a tool that designs for you. So, you know, the grid itself is making certain kinds of decisions. Um, so it's a mix of like, you know, I'm, I'm not saying no to grids, I'm saying uh, it shouldn't be a default answer necessarily, right? Right, yeah. um, know when to use one and also know when not to use one. Um, and play with both yeah. just in case if you're not a grid person, you know, make some grids. <laughs> uh, rest your system. If you're a grid person, try working without one. Nice. Um,
We got an answer to the pen tool. Oh yeah? Issue. Let's try it it out. comes from Benjamin Wardell. Um, so he says if you double click the pencil icon or pen icon, pencil double tool, click or double hold. click it. Double click it. Uh, and uncheck <sighs> keep selected. Yeah, keep selected. Oh, look at this. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, you Benjamin slash internet. <laughs> let's, let's try it out for a second. It's funny too because that comment came well after we had actually um, asked the question. So um, came to the rescue at the right time, Ben. Thank you. Could have gotten through that explanation a lot faster. I apologize. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> but I, I like what we got. I like yeah. what we got. Um, cool. So that's, we're here. We're moving on here. We've outlined these things. Now I get to use the actual pen, pen tool in the way that it's meant to be used, or kind of, sort of, uh, and annotate this one. And uh, are these annotations intended to live on in the final product? They're in the book now. Great. Um, so we can, re you know, ever, anything. So we're going to revisit a lot of the decisions that we make, you know, and I and I want to hear uh, what you guys have to say about some of these decisions that we're making on the fly. Uh, so I think more so than. It's not that every. It's not that these pages are final and all these things are on these pages, but I think we can sort of go back, uh, and and play with what we've generated so far. Um, yeah. So we'll revisit it, but it's in the book now. Great. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so let's sort of. Uh, I have a little blurb that I think introduces uh, the project. Um, so. Let's make a new spread. This is the part where, there we go. Yeah, I, knew it, I, I knew I could really get it. Cool, so you guys can see right here, made a new spread, has whatever was going on in the feed. Um, is Ethereum up or down? Okay, interesting. <laughs> Though I particularly know nothing about cryptocurrencies, that's, uh, right. that's Sam's little flair. You know, <laughs> maybe maybe you guys in the chat can uh, get into it. Uh, weather's weather's still where it stable. is. Stable, stable weather. Stable weather. The clouds are still broken. We're we're almost blinking here. We're getting <laughs> there. Um, the incident reportedly left her fellow passengers and cabin crew alike in tears. Terrifying. No idea what that's about. We might but. find, yeah, I mean, we might find that all the news is bad. Yeah, maybe that's the you conclusion. Know, I've project. had a good feeling about it for a while, but um, yeah. again, interesting to see this generative, these reports um, giving us a pulse check on, <laughs> I guess it's us to, up, up to us to determine whether that's good or <laughs> yeah. bad, up or down, whatever, but um, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, it's a little... A little scary, maybe. Yeah, so these are not pulling in the headlines. They're pulling in sort of the, I think, first line or, or whatever it is. And that's like an a API that's available. So anyone that would want to use that and sort of have it on a website so it brings in news or whatever, all the, this kind of thing can be found relatively easy. Um, cool. So from here, I think that I want an intro. Um, so for this intro, uh, what do you guys think about? Again, another type face that I don't think I've ever said out loud, at least not in a public forum, but soul, or soul, soul, soul. Are you not soul. giving yourself an easy task here? No, I'm not, <laughs> but that's all right, you yeah. um, know. So we're going to do an intro and, you know, when you're an undergrad, and you're working in type and you're being super respectful and you're placing everything exactly as it should and you're respecting sort of the impossible task of a type designer. Um, that's great, you know, that's awesome. Super important stuff. Not an undergrad, we're in uh, Adobe Live, you know, we make the rules. So I'm gonna stretch some type and give us sort of something to respond to. I love it, the dreaded words, we're gonna stretch some type. Yeah, there you go, oh that's, I'm sure there's a, a, a fellow professor out there that just cringed, that was like, what are you doing? A single tear shed. Uh, yeah, single or multiple tears just shed. <laughs> uh, but the whole name of this game is, is kind of playfulness, and yeah. uh, the tired phrase, breaking the rules, but that's, I mean, we're creating new rules. You're creating new rules, <laughs> and they're happening on the fly. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, 
everything on the fly for sure, and we can always revisit it. Um, okay. So I thought it'd be fun to kind of jump in here and um, generate some form out of this word. Um, so we're gonna, guess what, <laughs> use some scripts. Uh, let's go my desktop. I have some scripts and I outlined the one that I wanted to use. So these, uh, so in all the scripting that we're doing in InDesign is uh, custom. I mean, Sam def definitely referenced a lot of things and a lot of things are borrowed and sort of when you get to that place of, um, of, uh, of, of writing code, there's, you know, a ton of repurposing other people's work and whatnot. This specifically though, for the uh, Illustrator scripts are totally um, borrowed or taken or uh, compiled uh, from people that have shared their stuff on the internet. Uh, this one is specific. Um, when I was in grad school, uh, one of my classmates reached out to uh, Keetra Dixon, um, fellow alum grad, and asked her about digital design and sort of the more generative, weird type face, like type experiments uh, that she does. Her work is beautiful if you guys want to check it out. Um, and she responded in a super thorough way that only a professor can and actually sent us a bunch of the scripts. So uh, <laughs> we're going to mess with one right now. Wow. <laughs> so I made some adjustments to this one. Um, but what it basically does is it, it distorts, it duplicates and distorts whatever it is that you have selected uh, in a bunch of different ways. So you end up with like this jumbled mess. Right now, I'm interested in coming up with a shape. Um, so I'm gonna take that and sort of like, and it's gonna take a second. <laughs> this um, is a complicated Pathfinder operation. Right, right? <laughs> yeah, we're testing the limits of my computer. <laughs> uh, so it generated sort of a really complicated, complex shape with, you know, even with the opacities, and I'm kind of undoing most of what it just did just to get to that shape, because uh, I think it generates a really, like, sort of unexpected uh, and interesting shape. So I'm gonna take that shape. Boom, that's, that's that shape. I wouldn't have drawn that shape. I wouldn't have come up with these little points. I wouldn't have, you know, I would have fixed it. Um, I would have sketched. I would have done all these things that would have sort of, like, placed my personal agency and aesthetic over uh, chance and, and sort of randomness. Uh, does that mean this shape is beautiful? No, it doesn't. <laughs> but it means it's unexpected. Uh, we could, you know, try to run it a couple more times and see uh, if there is, could pick a favorite. Yeah, so is there a sort of a, there's obviously a logic into how it mm -hmm. produces the result, but the results are different each time. Uh, is that correct, every time you run it? Um, there's some, I guess, randomness or yeah. built in. Uh, yes, I waited to answer that question. I believe the answer was yes, but I waited to let it run so that <laughs> Just in case. I could double check uh, and make sure that that's actually true. Yeah, so the, yeah, so the numbers um, sort of like, you know, within uh, the script for this specific action, there are numbers that get randomized. Um, Nice little buffer of waiting. There you go. So here we have another shape. Boom. Um. So while Lucas is uh, running some more experiments here, I just want to remind everybody that we're going to be reviewing some challenge submissions in 40 minutes, 4-0. Um, so if you're working on it, that's awesome. Um, if you're not sure what we're talking about, check the challenge tab to the right of the chat tab on Behance, and you'll find instructions there. You're going to be creating a summer-themed recipe card. Um, and as you can see, we sort of pushed the limits of form and structure. So uh, it's going to be really fun to see you know, <laughs> the work that you do. Uh, we'll be taking a look at those live on air providing some thoughts and eventually picking um, uh, our favorite who will win a one-year Creative Cloud subscription, which is pretty dang cool. It's no joke. Yeah. Adds up. Yeah. So um, make sure to submit those uh, within 40 minutes, and we'll be taking a look at that. Cool. So we have... A 
we going to vote? We're going to vote. Okay. <laughs> Why I not? hope everybody's ready to vote. So, we've just generated three uh, forms that you're looking at, shapes, um, out of a typeface. We, we had a typeface, set intro, stretched right. it out in InDesign, brought it into Illustrator, ran a script that distorted and, and transformed, mm -hmm. um, and then used a Pathfinder operation to flatten that into a single shape. Mm -hmm. And if you're still with us after all that, <laughs> You get a chance to vote on which shape you find most yeah. interesting, I suppose. Yeah, so, you know, specifically for this command, I let, um, it, it, it ran the script based on the, you know, the, the frame around the word. Otherwise, it would just been too uh, complex uh, of, a shame for, uh, of a shape for this specifically. We'll come back to it and play around with that uh, piece of scripting in a different way to get, like, more of a texture later uh, for a different context. But for right now, I think these are sort of the, the three forms, and if you can see a difference, which I, I know you can because you're all uh, designers and have great eyes. <laughs> well, let's have a vote. Yeah. Well, and it's anybody's guess how we're going to actually... I've Count. definitely <laughs> seen more A's and B's than C's, um, and I hope I didn't just swing the vote. You did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> so, A and B. Let's have a second round of voting. Yeah. Hey, Matt. Matthew Ross uh, went to Cranbrook with me. I see his right. name over there. Recognizing some people. Cool. Thanks for the support. Yeah. And suddenly the well is dry. Olivia. I'm seeing some, at least more recently, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's looking like B. I can't repeat A. Oh, there might be a problem with a repeat. <laughs> oh, that's great. I'm so happy yes, this happened. There are constraints in the chat pod to it's an attempt at minimizing like trollish behavior. If you repeatedly say the same thing yeah. that you did before, you won't be allowed to chat. So I'm people really, can't put it again. I'm really excited that <laughs> this process has gotten us here. Me this too. is a very beautiful, rich right. uh, place to be at. Okay, so I mean, I guess like you B. can just B is killing it right okay. now. I mean, did I vote? I didn't vote. I'm looking at it. I don't totally. So these are kind of like, you know, a little bit too um, static, I think. There's not, you know, there's like these sort of moments where you get like a spiky kind of thing. But as form, I don't, I don't, there's not like enough movement in, in the shape itself, I think, to really get me going. But there's enough around the spread that maybe we're just going to see where it goes. And we can revisit it later. Um, I'm not signing any papers. I'm not committing to anything right now. But um, for now... Let's bring this nice in here. That's huge. Thank nice. you, everybody, for voting. Uh -huh. Yeah, so if, as you guys can see, like, you know, within the grid, not to jump back and forth between too many things, um, I made some tweaks from the place that we started and what I was kind of showing you guys. Um, if I run text uh, from this green line, and hopefully you can see my cursor, um, it's going to hit... Uh, this this uh, grid orange guide is going to hit the X height of the text as it comes down. Same thing uh, with the center point guide, and it's going to hit the baseline right here at this green guide. Um, so there's a little bit, depending how we place things and where we place things, we're gonna we're gonna be hitting things and sort of reiterating the grid in a uh, productive, healthy way. Productive, healthy way. What am I talking about? That's your undergrad coming out. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I'm bringing this shape right here and I'm kind of, you know, playing and challenging and constraining what we already have on there. I kind of like this sort of takeover, this hostile takeover that we have here. Um, now I'm going to go back and find us that little blurb. Um, I'm going to take this portion for now. I'm going to come here, and what I had in mind for this, and we can see how it turns out and make some decisions from that, is that I was going to run it right here. Uh -huh. And then now I'm going to, sorry, I'm leaning in really close, but I'm looking for that right here so I can pull it to the inside. Boom. Um, so I'm sure all you guys know exactly what just happened. <laughs> You might and have what I just did. Yeah. But 
this kind of process was at least new um, for me. So what I did is, you know, I had a shape to begin with and then I went to the uh, type tool and I chose type on a path tool. Uh, I placed it onto the object. Uh, and then there's this little line and maybe it has a name. If anyone knows the name of that little line, uh, maybe if I hover over it, I can tell you what it is. Uh, but yeah, I get the little symbol when I go over it. And if you pull that to the outside, the text is in the outside of the shape. And if you pull it to the inside, the text is in the inside of the shape. Um, I wonder if I did... Yeah, some little handle or something. Yeah. So I kind of want some space between the edge uh, and the text. Um, there's, you know, text box frame options that you can bring that further inside. I found that a really easy way to do that is to put a, um, a stroke on the shape. And because the shape itself isn't that meaningful to us, meaning like we made it, it can be different. It doesn't have to look like what it looked like before. And I actually kind of like getting a little bit of a rounded experience to it. Um, rounded experience. Uh, so we're gonna do that um, just so that we get a little bit of a buffer. And you know, there's like some moments where it's kind of eating itself and I think it's kind of funny. So I'm gonna let that ride. Um, there's not something particularly <laughs> valuable about this information other than me introducing the project. Um, I'll include that info uh, later on so you guys can read it or you can read it straight from the thing. Uh, but guess what? We ran out of space within this object. So I wonder if we can come in here. Ran out of space to fit the entire... To fit the entire... String of text. String of text, yeah. So see, like, yeah. yeah so. I hope it's that. Uh, so in the same way, yeah, it's over, in, in the same way where if you had a column and you ran out of space, uh, it would want to grow, it does here. So I actually never done this this way. I'm gonna change the color just so we can see where that shape is for now. Um, but I wonder if I can just do this. Or maybe I, should, I need to establish that path oh, as a... Yeah. X and I oh, boom boom wow wild so typically that process is used um, you have a text box on one page or maybe it's in one column and you have an empty text box next to it fill up that first text box and your text goes beyond the edge it oversets um, and you can actually link the two so that all the the overflow, I've never had to describe this before, I don't even know if it's a good job, goes yeah. automatically into the t second text box. Right. Um, so it just... flows. Um, and you've done that with two shapes, com uh, yeah. complex and custom shapes within each other. So yeah. Well, set on the edge. What we're talking about here, just for the sake of doing it this way, um, this box, too much text, press that little button, link it to the next box, boom. And That's you know, it. obviously you can do that while having like a reasonable placement of text and all of that. But yeah, so this is a pretty sort of like conventional, traditional way to come to that issue. Um, yeah, so because I made a new text box, see how my things are not lining up mm -hmm. in the way that I promised they would. Uh, Command B, get to the text frame options. I come to baseline options and I actually want the X height. So now I'm getting uh, yeah. Nice, clean, rational design. <laughs> uh, so, maybe we want, maybe, maybe we want this to be a little more, a little more, a little like more that. size. A little more. Maybe one little. <laughs> just a little extra. So just. Now this makes like now I feel silly for ever having uh, <laughs> neglected our now the whole voting kind of just like let's just amp up this type and use all our ABC. I wonder if I s did that. If it, oh, is our stroke in a different? Yeah, it is. Boom. Yeah, sometimes rich blacks and some 
Yeah, sometimes when you're coming in from um, going back and forth from Illustrator and InDesign, it um, maybe maybe it's set up as a CMYK. I'm not totally sure what happened. But anyway, now we're here. Let's make this magenta again, just so that we can um, see where we're at. I kind of want more size from this. I don't know what you guys are thinking. Are we getting any opinions on the type of decisions that I'm making? We do not. We did have uh, Domenico um, mm -hmm. was reminded of Polisher Shakespeare in the Park oh, posters yeah. as a result of what we're doing here. Any opinions there? Uh, I mean, it, it, if only I got her paychecks, am I right? <laughs> um, no, that stuff is really great. I think, and it's pretty. I think just even like historically, she's been a person that people have looked at for like dynamic and sort of like personal um, formal decisions with typography, I think that, you know, um, yeah, I don't mind, I don't mind being, I don't mind reminding people of her, but right. yeah, but yeah, I think for sure, uh, I mean, and, you know, she's in Helvetica talking about how that aesthetic reminds her of capitalism and questioning sort of the rigidity of type and sort of what that means, um, which is one opinion, but um, for sure as a person that kind of like, I, it's funny that I'm reminding someone of her because I think of her work as, and of course she's at a point now where she's barely doing any clicking. She's sort of more of a big picture right. napkin in right. a taxi uh, person, but yeah, it's like a really personal sort of um, use of, type, of typography, which I think is great. So right now I'm looking at these and I'm kind of most excited when we get a little bit, like, like I don't want anything to say like to be like, I like it when the type coll collapses in itself and it's kind of ridiculous and legible right there, but I don't necessarily want the shapes to hit each other. I don't know why. This is sort of like just where I'm at right now. What is it? Are you interested in the tension of them coming close? Yeah, yeah. And I'd love to hear some opinions on that if anyone has any, but that's sort of where I'm at right now, where I kind of, I knew, I knew about the first shape as a plan coming into this. I knew, you know, to bring that word into uh, Illustrator and to generate that shape through that word and bring it back here. I didn't test how that type was going to look. Um, I don't know, like I listened to podcasts and um, this one podcast I listen to a lot, they always mention, and it's two people, that they whenever they get to a place where there's like an interesting sort of idea in the green room, they stop right there and they don't talk through it. They kind of, they save the show for the show. Mm. <laughs> if that makes any sense. So like once I knew what I wanted to do with that shape, I didn't try it because I didn't want to know what it would look like and I didn't want to decide uh, before I was, you know, here with you guys. So now I'm kind of reacting to this in the same way that I would um, by myself in my room or <laughs> at an agency or wherever I'm doing work, uh, which is, for the first time, and I, you know, not that this is like the most unique way to lay like, type I've ever seen, um, but it's sort of brand new to me right now. Um, and do we need to make another box or should we go down and scale with the type? Are you kind of aware of how much type is left offset That's right now? That's a good now? question, we could check. Um, is there none and it's just lying to me? Oh, it's 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 me being really silly. And, it's white. And it's white. Yeah, it's white. <laughs> Arturo is curious uh, if you can um, rem recommend a good podcast. Maybe it's the one you were just uh, referencing. Yeah. So, the <laughs> so if any of my friends and family are watching this, they're laughing because um, I watch way too many uh, sports podcasts. Um, I watch a ton, and actually, so right now I'm just changing the shape because why not? Uh, just to buy us a little bit more space um, so we can get through the whole thing without having to draw a new shape. Um, so I'm a big fan of The Ringer. Okay, I've uh, heard the title. Uh, That's uh, about it. There's like a podcast network. It's like Bill Simmons thing after he, uh, after they shut down Grant Lynn when he left ESPN. Um, yeah, and then I actually really got into fictional podcasts recently. So Sandra, is really, really great. Uh, and then Homecoming before that was really, really great. 
No, I think, yeah. Um, but especially when I was uh, living in Detroit and my family was in Chicago, I would get through like, you know, a set of the whole, just nonstop five hours of podcasts. Design podcasts, there's a ton out there. Um, what is it called? Uh, my friend uh, Rory uh, was part of the beginning of, I forgot what it was called when he was doing it, but uh, I think it's called Scratching the Surface now. Mm. Um, but yeah, Rory King was a part of that. And it was, I haven't checked in on it in a while, but it was pretty great uh, back then. And there's, I mean, there's a bunch of the classic ones, the W. Millman and, and all that. Um, I don't totally, yeah, like, I guess because I was in grad school and I was talking about design every day, <laughs> I needed to not have that as my podcast experience. So while I was designing and working on things that I needed, didn't need to think through so much, or they were more sort of reaction based, sort of like instinct design stuff, uh, I would love to have a podcast in and usually it would be about basketball. Hmm. And do you work with podcasts, music going? How do you, Depending on what working? I'm working on. Yeah, oh, yeah so, for all right, sure. so explain that a little bit. Uh, so if it's if I'm if I'm working on the kind of thing that I've already made all the decisions per se, or there's no reading involved, mm. uh, then I don't mind having uh, something narrative or something you know like a podcast going. But if I'm working on something that you know I need to be proofing or reading or I need to be like really on top of, or if I'm getting a you know a file ready for print, which is for anyone that has done that, um, especially when it's the kind of thing that you're getting thousands of copies printed. Uh, super terrifying. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of hit the brakes on that. It's about concentration there. Yeah. Um, so this is the mess that we made. I'm kind of into it. What do you guys think? Let us know your thoughts in the chat. Yeah. It's dynamic. It's, yeah, it's dynamic, but I, I still think that the shape is maybe like, I think the internal, like where they start to like, fight with each other a little bit, it starts getting excited, but it's still like kind of fills up the space in a way that maybe it's a little too static. Um, so yeah, so the, the bulk of that stuff, and I can kind of read it, which was sort of, so if we're gonna talk about, if, if I could go back to what I said as like, you know, there's um, Roman Mars, someone mentioned, yes, 100%, yeah, 99% uh, uh, Invisible, incredible podcast. Uh, <laughs> Uh, from a design perspective, but also from a storytelling perspective uh, in general. But yeah, so if you're talking about like, you know, there's like a brief from the client or a brief that sort of like looks at viewership or um, audience, there's a brief that sort of it's your personal like redefined brief. And then there's this third sort of brief from the object. So it's like looking at a thing and seeing what it wants. Uh, this bigger sort of block of text that I have on the screen right here was kind of me preparing for the phone call uh, with you guys <laughs> and trying to, f to wrap my head around what it is that I wanted from this experience based on what you guys had told me, uh, which, you know, throughout the process have been super uh, supportive and open to whatever I wanted to do. Uh, so my focus is in putting together a piece of programming, programming meaning this event, uh, that highlights aspects of design, discourse, and practice that commit to what I believe to be a healthy and exciting uh, methodologies. That being a focus on how we relate to our tools and how we understand what it means to mediate. So basically offering something I believe is uh, both representative of my perspective and also something I believe to be of value to be presented. All that while respecting the format and value of the system through which this is being presented. Adobe offers a platform um, through which brand enthusiasts and users can get insight into the production process of select designers. I like to open up what design production can and should look like in 2018, especially in what, uh, especially put into juxtaposition with the tools of the trade. Uh, so that's just sort of like me meditating on what was offered to me as the brief for this and coming up with my own sort of definition of what it is that I wanted to do. Uh, this, you know, most of the time when I work through a project and kind of come up with my own set of goals isn't, it's not something that I share because no one wants to see it. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, cause this whole thing in my head is about transparency. I'm kind of sharing it with, with you guys. Uh, and then when it comes down to it, it's about complicating my authorship while playing with the barriers between user and designer and tool. So that's sort of this moment that I think is maybe. And so you mentioned earlier that um 
the, kind of the three perspectives brought mm -hmm. brought into any project the the client's sort of expectation vision brief your own expectation and vision bringing something to it and then the object itself that you were calling it the object mm -hmm. uh, and I I feel like what's happening currently using the live video format mm -hmm. designing on the fly acknowledging that you can sort of change things um, go back and revisit them and just kind of go without a plan even in some moments mm -hmm. is that part of it is this is that's what the object kind of is the live format, is this, is us totally. talking, is the audience coming into it. Um, and it's telling you the decisions <laughs> that we're kind of making or not making. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think, you know, there's some stuff that, I, I don't know if you guys relate to this, but uh, there are times where I think I know what I want to do and I think I know what will or won't work. Um, and then, you know, I do my sketches and I have sort of, you know, like these are the five directions and and then I have to stop and, and really think about it. I had a professor that told me, you know, whatever it is that you do, just do way more just to get all of the sort of like obvious answers out. Uh, because until you've sort of like exercised all of those obvious answers that are sort of like muscle memory, especially when you've been working for a while, like I think especially when you've been working for a while and you've built up so much muscle memory of how to solve simple design problems, um, the immediate way in which you approach a problem is sort of like known, I think. Uh, and, and it's known to you. Like um, very often when I start a project, I'm less excited about what I come up with than like a few hours into it when I start running out of things to do, mm -hmm. and then I have to surprise myself because I just have to come up with something uh, and react to what's in front of me. And do you find it's, uh, I mean, it can be challenging to do that, right? Yeah, totally, because I think we're taught, you know, to be super critical, uh, and we're taught to be super critical of ourselves. So I think in many ways, um, being a designer and artist is like having the stamina to withstand the you know like countless number of uh failures that <laughs> we produce you know so like we're making all this stuff and i think there's a world where you can look at this spread that i just made and say that it's a disaster uh i it's kind of like an exciting disaster to me right now <laughs> but i wouldn't fight anyone if they told me they thought it was hideous um but i think that kind of letting yourself go to these places and seeing what happens and maybe you know like out of this maybe i would just get so excited about this that i would like you know, like take a screenshot of that and sort of like isolate that uh, like formal moment, bring it into Photoshop, change the colors, explode that and turn into like a diffuse background. I don't know, like I wouldn't see this unless I let everything that came up until this point happen, right? So, um, let's just do that. <laughs> let's do that. Because I feel like it's missing maybe a little bit something. Um, you think the overall kind of spread that we're looking at? Yeah, we're kind of using this spread as like a testing ground, like mm -hmm. testing grounds for the aesthetic of the general uh, publication and sort of the movies that we're going to make later on. So I think we might as well sort of like overdo it a little bit for now. Um, another thing that for me it's like a lot easier to rein something in um, once I've gone too far. Right. So if it feels like we're going too far right now, yeah, maybe I want to go too far. But uh, like maybe, yeah, like I don't know, like because once you solve something and you get it together and it's tight, it's really hard to sort of inject excitement into it from my perspective. Right, right. Um, but if you have something that is loose and sloppy maybe, and uh, but exciting, like it, it means something to you, uh, then I think that it's a lot easier to sort of take that and like apply some discipline to it and resolve some of the tighter moments. Um, it's uh, Yeah, I think in my experience, just um, to state what you did, right. uh, is uh, it, it is much easier, especially relying on the training to sort of resolve those moments or to um, mm -hmm. apply a little structure, clean some things up, if you will, um, but to imagine the newness or excitement or pushing it mm -hmm. um, which you know was the task all along. Once you have something there that's already structured, it becomes that much harder to break free from that. I think. So I'm just kind of like seeing what's up. 
It's kind of coming in here. We want to lose some of the diffuse corners. We just want to let that be that. Um, maybe I want to brighten it up a little bit. Get a little bit more contrast. Maybe just like that. Yeah. Who knows? Platelets. Who knows? Just a reminder that we've got less than 15 minutes until we'll be reviewing um, the contest challenges of the day, and we've got we've got 11 already. So uh, I know that there are more out there. In the in the less than a minute that it's taken me to say this sentence, we've arrived at something pretty much unimaginable without the process of experimentation. What started as a screenshot. Of a of a moment in your work that you found particularly interesting, and, and I mean, I really, I, just, I I was only talking about it because I was trying to explain what I was saying. Right. But I follow that thread. No, it's great. It's like taking it seriously at the same time that you can kind of not take everything so seriously, um, at least serious right. in the sense that you stop yourself from doing something that may yield a really creative result. So one of my favorite shortcuts is Shift Option Command S, you know, save for web. It's great. The claw, have you heard it referred the claw? to? The save for web claw, and everybody oh, has yeah. one. It's like how you press all those right. keys together. That's funny. My is... pinky's on Shift, my middle finger on Option, my thumb on Command, and my pointer finger. Yeah, on... that's that's what I've got too. Yeah. And but now I've gone Shift Option Command W, which is the oh. new export workflow intended to kind of shorten this process. It removes some of the options. Oh, it does? Yeah, so this is, I think they refer to this now as legacy, the Save for Web workflow. Uh, but you still can't export a looping GIF from anything but Save for Web, uh, if that's your jam in Photoshop. That's good to know. Oh, man. I think somewhere in there, there was like a slight dig calling me old or something. Oh, no, no, no. But, uh, I just work here, so I have to. <laughs> I'm just yeah, totally right. joking. <laughs> I'm 100% joking. Um, legacy, is that like a... Yeah, I put it in quotes, yeah, too. Like, I, even I'm kind of like, yeah, it is a language that is... Boom, is that adding something for us? Is that doing something that we like? Let's take a look at that this way. Is that just too much noise? Where are we at? Here's an idea, and I don't know if this is gonna work, but what if we just make the, what if we make that stroke, and we take away, ah, oh, really interesting. It's like a banner effect. But maybe we leave the middle one? Cause no, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. Can we do that? We can do that. <laughs> we can do anything we want. Let's go here, and I guess I curve them. Do I want to curve them? We can go both ways, see if people have an opinion. Um, I like that the curve actually sort of references what you just added in the background. Right. It sort of gives yeah. it this organic, wormy kind of. Yeah, that's kind of cool. But now we'll, what do we do with this middle one? If anyone has an opinion on whether we're going the right direction with this banner <laughs> experience, I keep asking. I want you guys to you know, just come on, uh, help me out. <laughs> yeah, no, it'd be great no, to I'm get kidding. some responses to the work. Uh, I mean, uh, I personally have have kind of imagined, you know, ways in which uh, breaking my own typical workflows can sort of lead to somewhere. And we, you know, we've gotten here in in less than an hour and a half. Um, and we're already taking a look at work that I know looks quite different than uh, typically what you what you see. So this is kind of just funny to me to like just make it just jam it because we so you know we had this word that was sort of like where we started. If you okay, so there's the grid. There's like this sort of um, 
environment data on that grid on this kind of banner. And then I wanted to just really kind of like reject the structure of that by introducing the stretched word that really is structural in many ways and it kind of reiterates some kind of grid while defining or defying the original grid. Um, and you know, and then we, we explored on top of that with these shapes and running type on these shapes. Uh, but now we've gotten into a place where that little sort of white moment felt like a text box or sort of like a container of sorts, but in a really like kind of pathetic and ridiculous way. <laughs> <laughs> and I just think it's kind of funny to run text right there. Um, but maybe, I don't know, maybe not. And the questioning continues. Yeah, maybe letting it be a little quiet is the very thing that kind of uh, gives it importance. I don't know, the fact that it's just like rejecting the space behind it, you know what I mean? Like in a way, like to add it to that container, it's sort of it um, responding to the allotted space, but just letting it run in the middle and letting it go across that bar is kind of rejecting. Uh, Which implies that you were aware of that space. You, I mean, or you pasted something and forgot where it landed. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. For sure. Arturo, do you have the same control over stroke and InDesign as you do in Illustrator? They should have pretty much the same parity, I think, Yeah. in the stroke panel. You can do everything the same. One thing that I was curious about is to why um, when I click a line stroke to outside, it goes to the inside. Oh, is it because it's the baseline of the text? Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, and it being centered, it's centered around the baseline of the text. Is there a way to, if anyone knows, um, make the stroke be centered with the X height of the text or to like displace that stroke in here? Oh, well, I know you could displace the text itself. Oh, right, bring totally. It lower. You'd be dropping the baseline of the text. Um, but I can't get my text options through there, so I have to go through uh, oh, yeah, character panel. my character panel. It does it. It ignores me when I select the object because it's text on the funnel. I can just go in here and put it. Kind of doing it optically here. Mm -hmm. Looks pretty close. Yeah. Well, would you look at that? Yeah. And it did all of them because the text is linked. Cool. Is there an easier way to round single corners in Illustrator, like in InDesign, rather than use scissors round corners and join pads again? I'm imagining in a shape with hard corners, what you're asking is, can you round a single corner as opposed to all of them? And the answer mm. would be yes, if you were just to select that point that created that corner uh, using the direct selection tool. Click that and you should get a corner option. Um, but I think you're asking about Illustrator, so maybe we can ignore that. But Arturo's coming in with an answer as well for Nick. Keep the questions coming. We have five minutes until we're going to be reviewing some work. Sweet. Yeah. I'm just curious now to take a look at, um, maybe, maybe we do want some color. Got a lot of submissions coming in. Yeah. Ooh. This is the last. Uh, it's a little too island based, isn't it? It's like. It does look like an archipelago. Oh, man. Yeah. Can 
kind of Ninja Turtle vibe going on over here, a little bit. Which one was the, the more, like, violet eating Ninja Turtle? Oh, gosh. Leonardo was blue. Michelangelo was orange. Donatello? Donatello was, like, yeah. If anyone, <laughs> well, Donatello, yeah, yeah. Like, right. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, I think... Between four. I think it's really important to get, like, when you're, you know, referencing an important piece of work like the Ninja Turtles to, like, really get your facts right. Right. We don't want to um, do that a disservice yeah. today or any day. Yeah. Raphael's red. Is that one easy to remember because R? Raphael red. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I have, I have so many of these pulled up. Raphael is red. Karen's got a really quick, great question, I think. So cool. many of my clients are more um, <laughs> traditional and respond with suspicion to things they don't have visual context for. What's the balance between new and familiar? Good question. Um, Isn't that the question? I think that, obviously I don't have an answer because, you know, I mean, I have s many answers but I don't have an answer that's gonna be like applicable in a way where you can turn and like use this and it's always gonna work or whatever. I think in my experience, um, being earnest and committed and unapologetic about the way you're approaching work, like, like if you're invested and committed in a specific solution, uh, typically I think that leads to better work uh, and usually you can sell that in one way or another. I think. Whenever you enter, I think, a situation where you're selling your work or you're presenting it and you're framing it through the language of the client, it gets into a weird, like, sort of, like, manipulation game or whatever. Uh, so I try to stay away from, you know, trying to convince someone uh, to do something in the way that I'm excited. You know, I, tr I, try to, I try not to convince people to go a certain route, but I try to just, like, bring in whatever energy keeps me excited. Uh, and show them the work that came out of a place of excitement for the project uh, and make sure that the same energy I had working on it, I have presenting it to them, which I think sometimes is the trickiest part. It's like, you know, we'll go and we'll get excited about something, we'll make this thing, and then we come into a meeting feeling like it's not gonna go how we want to and we don't bring that positive energy into the presentation of the work and we kind of talk them out of it before they ever even had an, ex you know, an opportunity to fall in love with it. Um, I also think, you know, like, there's that three-tier thing. There's, like, a bunch of different ways to, like, select work or, or choose how to approach work or whatever. And I think, ultimately, it, it has, you have to cater to the person that's signing your check. Like, you have to respect what they want, you know? Not in a way that you have to, like, trick the client into choosing the work that you like, but you have to, I think, uh, when entering a project, be respectful of what they're expecting. and. Not always, but sometimes it's a it's someone's like dream, you know, like it's like someone's like whole whatever. It's like a new business or whatever. It's like it's like they've been working super hard to to get something done that's a you know that's an expression of who they want to be in the world or whatever. And you have to like cater to that energy and to uh, and, and and respect that. I guess it's more rambling than answering, but I'm getting there. I'm like I'm like circumventing the answer without arriving at it, but. Um, yeah, but sometimes it needs to be traditional. <laughs> I don't know, and I think within that you can sort of check um, moments of that. You know, I think we're already at a place where you know postmodern work falls into a traditional category. It's like um, not using a grid. All of these things are already there's precedent for this stuff, so it's not necessarily new. You know, uh, I think it's more so like your personal like relationship to form what you can offer what you bring to the table and how excited it makes you and find a way to translate that into something that they can also be excited in. Uh, there's like a Michael Rock thing, which is like just take your client's advice and just do it to like an absurd degree. So if they say they want a corner office, just make an office that like is jotting out of the building. <laughs> if they say make it red, just give them the reddest thing in the world. And in the process of like attempting to make that work, sometimes you can run into really exciting solutions. You mm -hmm. know? When you try to make the reddest thing of all time, uh, you can come. You know, you can get to a place where you wouldn't have otherwise. If yeah. that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Who said that? I or think Michael Rock said it. Michael Rock. Yeah. 
Great. Well, that was an incredible question. Um, too much of a question. It's too, it is a huge question um, and a great, I think, a great answer. Um, great thoughts on it at the very least. And we are actually at our challenge submission deadline. So we've got some things to look at. I've got them pulled up here. Um, you can see we have a ton of stuff. We've got probably, maybe, I'd say like maybe 20 minutes to go through this. So um, maybe we can talk about the work itself. Um, there's a, a range of kind of approaches here. Um, mm -hmm. Talk about you know things that we like. If there's if there's any advice, critique that we have for it, and ultimately we'll be picking a winner. So um, I'm just going to flip through them at the rate that we like to. But I will say that they used Adobe Stock, um, which always has points. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what do you think here for summer, summer guacamole? guacamole? So first of all, that looks delicious. Um, so if Adobe Stock could have like a link of where to purchase, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think they're structuring, it's, it's pretty structured, it's pretty clean, it's pretty clear. Um, there's a good sense of hierarchy. Um, I think the relationship between the sort of titling type, uh, the summer guacamole and sort of the information below it, uh, there's enough space between those two things, you know, it's like what's big is big enough and what's small is small enough uh, to have some nice hierarchy. I would say that there is a little bit of an inconsistency in the way in which things are spaced. So if you're going to go the route of like structured and clean, uh, then you have to make sure that that's, you know, really what you're getting. So uh, like, for example, between the word my rating uh, and that sort of like dashed line and between uh, instructions and that dashed line, like that's some, you know, inconsistent spacing. Um, I would sort of revisit, especially also how the word instructions is relating to the information below it. I don't have anything that I can f sort of say in a too productive of a way uh, to argue against having everything right aligned, mm -hmm. but I'm not totally sure why, especially with the numbered stuff. I think that's what's throwing me. Is yeah. It's not so, m and I've, I've heard it, we've heard it time and time again about, you know, not necessarily right aligning things just mm -hmm. for ease of reading but um, it's less the actual copy on the left but more that the primary indication of order is over there and then I'm flying and kind of uh, maybe that's where I'm, yeah. I'm struggling as well there's something a little disorienting about especially like bulleted or numbered lists that are right aligned for sure right but it's looking clean the color is nice you know like I think it like the that green that you brought in that offsets it's not the guacamole green it's a little like deeper I think that that just opposed with the image uh, is nice and I think that yellow pairs well um, so I think color is nice I think it's a good first pass I would just try to refine it um, and maybe have a little bit more uh, flavor in in sort of how things are broken up because um, right now it's 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 super yeah it, it wants to be this really clean thing uh, it's just not quite clean enough for that. Great. Well, thank you it for this good. submission. We will revisit it at the end, um, and we're just going to keep moving on. Crazy tomatoes, Caprese. Crazy tomatoes is crazy. Uh, tomatoes. Um, so there's definitely, you know, whoever made this definitely had some fun with it. Uh, the first thing that I notice is this border that's sort of like you're taking the colors from within the image and creating this sort of dash pattern. Am I kind of like reading it right? And there's sort of these gradient moments that come in. Um, I think that's kind of like an exciting idea of how to generate that color. Uh, maybe the color needs, but it is getting a little bit, um, maybe it's a little too dark. And I know you're taking it directly from the image, but maybe you need to like sort of like tweak it a little bit to like open up that green. I don't know if you agree with me, but I well I do because this there's a sense of like freshness that you need. Mm -hmm. and I think the oh, typical association, in, and I'm talking about in terms of food. Yeah, color wise, that I think in general has meant brighter and lighter. Um, so th where the kind of reds and greens are, again, they did come from the image, but they're sort mm -hmm. of looking a little like holiday plaid pattern to me. Um, whereas I'm really thinking like bright greens, really bright, super ripe right. tomatoes, and brightening that up might mm -hmm. kind of uh, infuse the overall look yeah, with I think, that spirit. Yeah, f I totally, I think you, you nailed it with that, with the, the color take. Um, I, yeah, I think it's it's exciting that there's definitely some play, especially even like 
and I don't totally know if I love the way that it's happening, but like the way, like the numbers kind of playing with those notches is kind of interesting. I wonder where else that could go if you kept opening that up, or even the way that that sort of gradiented red, like little box comes out into crazy. Um, maybe it's just that everything's feeling a little medium too. It's like you have, um, you have like this sort of play, but because it's happening so consistently, you're kind of normalizing this uh craziness so to speak mm. so because every single number is hap is is sort of like disorienting in the exact same way it's actually like pretty predictable in the way that in which it's oriented um i don't know if instructions is, is where you want to start playing with disorienting the reader <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> i think it's an easy enough dish that maybe it's okay but um i think how can you keep the dynamic uh sort of energy that you're going for but have it be understandable as like an ordered set of instructions, I think is where I would try to wrap my head around. Um, you know. Yeah, I think that's great. Great feedback. Um, definitely super useful there. Mm -hmm. Summer fruit soup. Cool. Yeah, I, I'm, first thing I'm sort of reacting to is like, I, I, I like the way, you know, summer is sort of responding to the shape and then you're continuing that through fruit soup so i can kind of see sort of you know the orange repeating but without it actually literally repeating um i wonder if there's like a way where that can even be more emphasized and maybe uh maybe there's an opportunity for summer and, and, and fruit soup to even get even bigger and maybe be more dynamic and sort of like offset your composition even more um it's definitely clean and organized yeah um but maybe it's feeling a little empty or a little, not empty, but um, it's not leveraging that uh, negative space uh, in sort of a productive way quite yet. I think they have a good like place to start as far as like establishing sort of this like focal point at the top, you know, talking about sculpture, you sort of add the optical weight at the top. Uh, so you're kind of doing that. Um, but maybe it just needs a couple more rounds of like play and seeing what else could happen. Yeah. I, I definitely agree. I think there's a this kind of um, full bleed mm -hmm. coming off the bottom left means that this opportunity was maybe missed up at the top to do that, just to kind of balance yeah, yeah, yeah. it out. Um, good colors. We're going to go a little bit quicker, I think. Okay. So we can get um, yep. Cool, yeah. I, uh, I like that you didn't shy away from having the image sort of do most of the talking. I think that I'm, I'm trying to think of what the exact context of these uh, recipes would be, but I think that, you know, I don't know, delicious fruit, seeing the fruit, I think is like the thing that's going to make me want to <laughs> do the thing. Right, I don't yeah. know. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, it's organized, it's clean. Um, I think that maybe the same, maybe there can be a little bit more play with, like you're, sort of, you're starting to build some tension by having these two discs at the corners and the space that's between them. I think maybe you can even amplify that hierarchy. Maybe there's not enough space in scale between uh, the slice and the actual orange, uh, where it just feels like it's a really big orange, a small orange, and not so much a play with the image itself. So maybe mm -hmm. if that slice gets even bigger and sort of challenges and creates a more dynamic negative space, uh, then you can sort of start to respond to that a little bit more directly. Yeah, it could be about depth as opposed depth to just... Depth, too, totally. Yeah. Here we go. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> make it, sell it, drink it. What more to be said? What more to be said? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I like the energy. I actually, you know, I think that everyone knows that I'm not a shy of the pen tool. On, like, so it definitely has that aesthetic. Uh, actually, I don't mind the color too. I think it's pretty fun. Um, definitely hinting at lemon stands, you know? <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the context may be accurate. Uh -huh. Good pun. Aw, oh, shucks. This looks like a magazine cover. Yeah, that's definitely feeling... Uh, yeah, good use of hierarchy, uh, I think, and, and even like, you know, you were saying depth with the last one, like here we have a little bit of a play, which is definitely like a magazine cover mm -hmm. move. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if that, that banner up top and sort of that space that we end up with up top, uh, could be, like, I'm not totally sure how this whole thing is situated within the frame. Maybe I want more space around the whole thing. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, here's the actual oh, recipe. Cool. Yeah, pretty clean and transparent. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think it's pretty. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the color fits the context. Mm -hmm. uh, just going back to what we were talking about, like bright and fresh, like yeah, totally. for this specific purpose, I feel like we're kind of. Especially with oysters. Yeah, yeah. In, in the world. Cool. Brazilian lemon juice. Here you go. Wow. It's not caipirinha though, there's no alcohol. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it looks good. I mean, I think that when you have good images, it's don't shy away from relying on them to do most of the work for you. Um, you have like this big expressive type moment that's not like overwhelming the image, but it is kind of crowding and, and, and uh, you know, I don't, um, it's nice, but I think a lot of that work is already getting done by the movement of the image of the, you know, the ice and the glass and the lime. So I don't necessarily feel like you need that type to, to do that. I think that the word fantastic, like how that's like typeset and the, the how uh, the weight, I think really plays nicely with the image. So like, I feel like maybe if it, if it just said lemon fantastic or fantastic lemon um, in that uh, face that that would be doing most of the work for you. I keep forgetting that some of these are two pages. Oh, cool. Yeah, so it's like more of a set. Yeah. Um, yeah, it looks good. I think most of the same notes. Yeah, definitely set up <clears throat> like a reusable, ele you know, elements that are reusable and then mm -hmm. kind of, you know, using color to uh, differentiate or highlight uh, specifically the feeling or mood or flavor that you're going for. I mean, that's certainly useful. It's a nice <clears throat> rational use. This one is just one page. Cool. Yeah, I think... Yeah, good energy, getting some stuff going. I think that might be just a couple too many moves, um, you know, because you have like, you know, the typeface, you have uh, salmon uh, poke in, and that's over the image. And then you have like the sort of script for fresh, and then you have like the sort of stacked square moment and the line that then has the gradients and dots. And then you move into the script that gets overlaid by this other text. So I think that maybe, um, the overall language of the thing is maybe of like structured and like, you know, uh, it, it's instructional, so there's a certain like level of like structure uh, that maybe some of these more, like maybe you can, you can refine the expressive moment or whatever, like that overlapping of ingredients with, I think maybe the word ingredient is not quite big enough because you're only getting one line to overlap with it. Uh, and that's sort of just making both that line and the word ingredients busy. Uh, so I think that maybe for this one would be a, a matter of like, taking away a couple moves and then refining the ones that you're left with. Right, yeah, but you've definitely given yourself a lot of elements to oh, yeah. make that choice with. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I would, I think that, again, this image, um, it's looking a little flat tonally, which is nice because it has a sort of soft, quieter mm. moment. And I do think that that's sort of replicated with the color palette and everything. Um, but again, I think in terms of this context, like I really want to be like mouthwatering at this Poke Bowl. Yeah. And, and maybe something a little more saturated or maybe a little bit more contrast might, might do that for this particular image. Wow. Yeah, cool, so we're getting a little bit more <laughs> movement across the page, like shape and color. I think that the way that you've like structured like these sort of containers for the text, you know, your text boxes are like moving around the page a little bit is, is really fun. But now I think that the way you're breaking out of the boxes uh, maybe is not, is either not quite consistent enough, so it's just, you know, like the way that only really like onion, actually onion twice, because it's yellow onion, red onion, are coming out of the box. I think that's not quite enough to establish uh, a move that I can, you know, that feels purposeful. Um, so it's feeling a little incidental or accidental there. Um, and I don't, yeah, maybe the color is not quite where it needs to go, but I, but I like the play of it. I wonder if you could just refine a little bit more. And, um, but maybe, yeah, maybe this one too is like, you have a good place to start where you've set up these sort of like, you know, the movement across the page. Now maybe it's a matter of like refining those moves just a little bit to get things a little tighter. I, I think something interesting here that's not necessarily a result of the actual design or layout itself, but the tone of the writing, um, which mm. is pretty small, so I don't expect that everybody's read it, but um, just to give you a sense for what we're reading. Keep sipping on that wooden spoon until you've staked your claim of flavor country. And Sick. <laughs> um, if the sun ain't heating up your apartment, then hit that cauldron with a splash of coconut oil and sweat as many onions as you feel comfortable passing through your person. Is like, maybe the world needs this. 
a little bit of like a new take on yeah. recipes and in this instructional content. And, and maybe I'm just suggesting that maybe the design has the ability to play with that tone and take this somewhere completely different, especially with a company yeah. named Kale Incorporated. There's probably free reign to take that as far left as you want yeah. um, or not. So nice, nice job on the writing. I don't know where that came <laughs> from. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, this one's pretty open, pretty fun. I think they're using, uh, they're getting some dynamic movement in a fun way. Uh, so my sort of like um, undergrad sort of rooted, you know, like just seeing that, just seeing cake hang out all by itself kind of bums me out a little bit. I don't know what the solution there would be. Um, Are you speaking compositionally? Or? Yeah, just like a, just like, you know, a, a, a title widow is yeah, a little yeah. bit of a, uh, I think that in some ways it's almost creating like a pocket uh, that uh, the word, you know, ingredient, kind of like that box kind of comes out, which kind of makes it a little bit more okay for me because that framing kind of gets reiterated mm. uh, and that like does something that. formally yeah. for me. Uh, but then I think that with the these graphic elements that you've introduced, you're sort of like balancing things out in a way that isn't necessarily making it feel more resolved, that's making it feel more static. So you kind of, you brought in movement, you have movement, but then you've you've hit sort of like every corner with the graphic elements and you sort of filled in all the space. So now it's the whole thing's gotten a little bit more static, which is a bummer because the, the, the cake itself is like flying through space, you know, like <laughs> it's kind of aerodynamic and, and, and it's, it points. Um, so I think that maybe, maybe scale with those, with the graphic elements, maybe just like how they're positioned, maybe they also have uh, angular uh, movement, angular movement. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, no, I think you have a good start. Great. All of these so far. Yeah. All right, we're gonna go even faster now. Barbecue balls. Uh, <laughs> one one piece of feedback. Delicious. delicious. I think the cover's pretty exciting. I think that like they definitely feel like they had fun with that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I think maybe some more of that energy on this spread. Nice. Okay, we've seen this. Cool. I think there's awesome color in that image, so you're relying on it to do most of the work for you. Um, there's a lot of movement here. Um, yeah, I think that maybe the only thing that th this, when you desaturate that like rich color, it kind of gets a little like muddy. So I'm not totally sure if I'm in love with that. And I think you've tried, you have like this sort of like nice symmetry with the way that you've balanced out the page, but maybe that's made it even feel even a little bit more static. So yeah. maybe, you know, you set up this sort of system, but then you do a play on it instead of just a repetition of it uh, mirrored out. Right, yeah, I think th I think that this channel that it creates could mm -hmm. be kind of like, I don't know whether it's an S-curve or kind of like a uh, mirrored symmetry or something, yeah. but you know, maybe this box becomes a little smaller and that becomes a smaller anchoring element and you kind of mm -hmm. want to draw from one box to the other. Um, vegan Buddha bowl. Cool. Yeah, it looks nice. I think, um, you know, the bowl is delicious and beautiful and colorful. So you you didn't try to get in its way um, by keeping everything pretty sort of, you know, organized and minimal and just working around that shape. Um, yeah, I think it looks, it looks great. Great. All right, we got three more. Cool. Curried pork and, yeah. Cool, so there's some fun use of icons. I, I, I wonder if you can rely on those even more so, just because they're so graphic, kind of even like give it, you know, make that the focus um, and kind of have the instruction itself maybe be an annotation of that like visual system more so than the instruction and then these images that sort of like support it. It was almost like a fun sort of like Ikea instruction yeah. moment. Like could you really push yeah. like the process of cooking food or the instructional yeah. aspect of that to rely solely on an icon set or something. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just find that kind of interesting. Yeah, like emoji recipe? Yeah. All right. Tita Tango recipe. It's a one page one. One winner. Yeah, we kind of, I think recipe, we got we kind of got to get, <laughs> get the whole thing in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think you have a good start where things are, are pretty clean. You're getting a little bit of like dynamic movement by running the title across. Um, I think maybe just even a little bit more, 
it's two things at once. I think you both want a little bit more of dynamic play, so maybe revisiting the type choice for the title or the way in which that's uh, challenging the structure. If you want to do something like playful and run it across, maybe even even bigger, maybe um, maybe it goes over the image even more. I don't know, like, but but I both want it to be more dynamic and more controlled at the same time. Yeah, and I th I think that I I noticed the use of a texture kind of in the background. I think. What's actually more interesting to me is that this main image has a ton of texture in it, right. and um, it could be that introducing contrast and maybe the background is, is just flat, either a solid color or white or something, um, you actually sort of like open up that image and revere it a little bit more, um, and, and then you, uh, again, have some more room to kind of play with the, the text and everything else to add additional texture mm -hmm. with those elements. Yeah, that's a good point. And finally, basil gimlet. Sounds delicious. Yeah. Yeah, so this one's nice. I th the idea of having space for notes, I think, is great. Um, I think that, you know, the, the type looks pretty uh, well structured. Um, yeah, it's pretty organized. It's pretty nice. Yeah, maybe uh, a bit hard to read some of the yeah, contrast. Even with the up. first page, maybe there can be a little bit more contrast. Um, like the. Yeah, like I think that maybe cleaning up the color just a little bit, or maybe that there's a gradient, or uh, am I seeing a little bit of movement in the color, or is that just my eyes? Uh, it looks like this kind of like cool areas. Uh -huh. uh, for me, it's kind of influencing this and bringing it a little like bluer. Yeah. So, but I can't tell if that's an illusion or real. <laughs> <laughs> well, this whole thing. Yeah, illusion. right. I'm not sure uh, if it's real. Yeah, I think it's. A, yeah, I think you're at a good place. I think we could nitpick, but for the most part, it, it's color. That, cool. Yeah. I'm going to open up one more that we saw um, that came in just before the deadline. Wait. Oh, here we go. Maybe one I missed. Cocoa Bananas. Cocoa Bananas. Wow. The best summer. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, this is not fair because I love bananas. That looks delightful, delicious. I want that recipe. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm biased. Um, I think you already made this point, which is it's food, so keep the color, um, you know, fresh in some ways. It depends on what the uh, what food, but I think it's a summer. The whole thing is summer themed. And this is specifically like borderline popsicle, so I think that that yellow wants to be a little bit more open. Um, I, I like the idea. I like your drawings. I think that that drawing that's over the image, maybe it's a little crowded. It took me like a second to even notice that it was there. Um, the beach ball. Um, I don't think I noticed that. What do you? Oh, <laughs> yeah. I just uh, noticed it. Yeah. So I think yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It feels like uh, you guys are maybe a little hesitant to sort of come in on top of the image uh, or sort of push the image. Uh, I know it's like a tight time and turnaround, but. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm just noticing that. Um, yeah, I think it's fun. I think that maybe a little, yeah, like the structurally could like be a little tighter. Um, but my main, main note, I think, to start off with is the color and the fact that I, I really like the playful energy of it. Cool. So you want to pick a favorite? I'm just going to fly through these at record speed. There's oh, I think they updated the spacing in theirs. That's what happened. All right. There you go. Oh, they they like got more even. They got an extra point for it. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this is hard. I like them for different reasons. Um, I think sort of the maybe the tightest one that we saw was the oyster okay. one or the vegan Buddha bowl one's pretty well. Basil one looks pretty good. So we got Buddha bowl. What were you thinking? I think that one looks pretty good. Yeah. The lemonade looks great. This is your choice. That one looks good too. Uh, <laughs> man, it's hard. Uh, so what is it that I'm looking for? I'm looking for I'm looking for the you know internal logic of the object. So I guess I'm looking for I'm trying I'm trying to define based on what the thing looks like. Um, because of the kind of project this is, what you guys were going for. So if it looks like an attempt at making this clean structured thing, then I'm looking at like how clean and structured it is. If it's playful, I'm looking how playful. Uh, if it has good energy, I'm looking like where is that coming from and where else could it go? So I guess, 
I'm just going to cycle through them one more time. Um, let's go with the Osh uh, oysters. Aw oh, shucks. All right. Oh, shucks. It might have been the pun that did it. Um, it congratulations, um, whoever did this oyster. We probably have a name somewhere, Raw. Is Tyler Florence the title of the... That sounds like a famous chef. Um, I think so. Maybe those two jobs. Yeah. So uh, we will be sending this winner um, a one-year Creative Cloud subscription for free. We're out of time today, so we're going to wrap. But tomorrow we've got a full day of programming starting at, um, well, 9 a.m. our time. That's different for everybody around the world. But be sure to tune in, check the schedule, visit this URL again. Um, we'll be back tomorrow at this same time, continuing a really, really interesting generative design uh, publication object. Um, and I'm excited to kind of see where it goes. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for asking us questions. And check back tomorrow for more great stuff.